That's my life right there. On this Good Shepherd Sunday, we are going to talk about sheep, um, and I know we all relate to that. But before we get there today, uh, how are your plants doing? Are your plants doing okay? Yeah? Yeah. And again, if, you, if yours have died, right, and there's no shame in that, it happens. Uh, we got plenty left over, and I know that they're using them in the daycare, and they're growing plants in there too, which is great. But there are plenty more on the Welcome Center. Feel free to take them. Uh, if you have kids or grandkids that you want to work with to have fun with it, it's a great project, feel free to take them. It's really interesting, isn't it? They're, they're getting to the point, and in in ours at home are much bigger than this. It's almost time to plant them, replant them, right? Yeah. That's part of the process, isn't it? It's part of the process. When we are baby Christians, we're kind of in this little container, but eventually we outgrow it. And we move from this role of being a baby Christian to a mature Christian, and we need meat, right? We need need a bigger place to grow from. We are now not just receiving, we're serving, we're leading, we're involved, because this is a natural part of the process. Eventually, we grow to the point where, you know, the sunflower comes out and the seeds will fall off and multiply other disciples, other sunflowers. So this one seed that I have up here, which is so small you can't see, turns into a field of sunflowers. The fruit of a seed, of an, a- an apple seed, is an orchard of apple trees. A little seed can create a forest, can create a field of sunflowers. This is God's design from the beginning, that we would bloom where we're planted to create much more than we can fathom. God's kingdom is like a mustard seed. It starts small, but it ex- explodes in growth. That's God's intention and design for each one of us. And so help the, we, we hope that this metaphor of uh, a seed growing in to something bigger than who we ever thought we could be would be something that would be meaningful for you and for I. Bloom where we're planted. So we continue this discussion of blooming with an emphasis today upon our city. And so the question today that I'd like us to wrestle with on this Good Shepherd Sunday is, how do we love our city? How do we love our city? Today we're going to pray for our city, and prayer is an incredibly important part of loving on our city. We pray, we lift our city to God and say, Lord, touch this city, bless this city. And we'll do that a little bit later in the, uh, at the end of the sermon is pray for our city. But how are we individually and as a church called to love our city? Now, I think about that and I get overwhelmed because, let's face it, every city in this country and on this planet has overwhelming amount of needs. There's hunger, there's homelessness, There's addiction. There are needs everywhere. And personally, honestly, just me, Paul DeZay, this one little guy up here with a microphone, I don't feel equipped, nor do I feel like I have special gifts in order to change our city. And so sometimes when we think about how are we called to love our city, how are we called to be part of the transformation of Columbus, Indiana, in Columbus as it is in heaven, it's kind of overwhelming. And so for many of us, we believe the lie that there is no hope, that God's going to blow it up anyway, right? We believe this bad theology that God's going to destroy the planet, so we don't even bother helping and loving our city. That's a lie that I believe today God desires to transform us into the truth that God desires for us to seek the welfare of our city, as it says in Jeremiah. So here is the big idea for today for everyone out there who is overwhelmed Uh, let us hear this truth. We bloom where we are planted when we obediently listen to the voice of the Good Shepherd. We bloom where we are planted when we obediently listen to the voice of the Good Shepherd. Now, I, I just shared with you, it's overwhelming to think about how we are going to transform our city, how this little seed is going to become a a uh, field of sunflowers of God's creation, new creation. But I think the truth is, is to believing that God will show us if we would just listen. And to be honest with you, I'm not very good at listening. Anybody, anybody with me not good at listening? I'm getting really good at talking. I mean, I got a microphone, right? I'm really good at talking, but I'm not very good at listening. And my wife and my daughter remind me of this all the time. So picture the scene. There I am in my recliner with my cup of coffee because 
that's where I'm at. And Rebecca and Stacy are there talking, and they're in, you know, conversation. They're talking about all kinds of girl stuff and makeup, and I, I don't even know what it is. Eventually, eventually, after the conversation shifts about three or four things that doesn't involve me, what, what do I do? I check out, right? I am somewhere else. My mind is over here somewhere. And they're in the middle of this conversation about who knows what. And then all of a sudden, Rebecca, she's really good at this, she'll say, Dad, what do you think? And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And then Rebecca, in her uh, comic voice, she is the party at our house. She just is all energy, and she's just so much fun. She'll say, Dad, you are a terrible listener. But I tell you the truth, it is hard sometimes to be a good listener. My mind wanders to other things. Sometimes when you're in the middle of a conversation with somebody, you can't wait to get to the part where you get to talk, right? So we are not necessarily very good listeners, and so we're confronted with this truth today that the good shepherd is speaking. In order for us to hear what he has to say, we have to do what? Listen. I'm not good at listening. Are you? Are you good at hearing the voice of the shepherd? Sometimes I think that we get this confusion that we think that the good shepherd only speaks to certain people at certain times. And you have to be good enough to have him speak to you. Or he only speaks on occasion. So, you know, you just kind of got to go do life until he speaks to you. I'm here to tell you today that the scriptures teach us that God is always speaking to you. To you. To me, to us. The question is, are we listening? If we want to be people that are involved in the transformation of the world, as our mission statement says, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, if we want to be a part of seeing our city being transformed into new creation. If we want to see our people, our friends, our family, our loved ones come to know Jesus as Lord, Savior, and King. It starts with listening. It starts with listening to the Good Shepherd, not tomorrow, today, not later, but now. And so let me talk a little bit about the shepherd, the sheep, and listening. And then we'll have a few minutes of quiet to listen to the shepherd, and then we'll pray for our city. So the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd, I love this metaphor, right? I love this metaphor. I'm sure you do too. The 23rd Psalm is like my absolute favorite. It's not, it's not just a funeral psalm. It's about everyday life. The Lord is my shepherd. Jesus says he is the Good Shepherd. And the Good Shepherd shows us what love is all about. The Good Shepherd. Now, if the disciples would have heard Jesus say this, which they did, the Good Shepherd, the first thing that would have entered into their mind is the word good. And that would have taken them back to the beginning of Genesis when God created all things, right? And he said that they were good, right? The Hebrew word is tov, good. And uh, he called and created us, and he called us very good or very tov. And on your cups, if you were here for Easter, I encourage you to write the words very good on it. So when Jesus said that he is the good shepherd, it helps us see that his mission is to recover the goodness we all know that sin has spoiled and messed up our lives. We look in the mirror and we don't see very good, right? We see broken. And yes, we are broken. But Jesus, the good shepherd, is recovering the goodness in your life. He's recovering the goodness in my life. He's recovering the goodness in this world. That is what new creation is all about. So the good shepherd is the one who is restoring the goodness of God's world. And then shepherd is a metaphor that runs all the way through the Bible. It's an amazing thread. Shepherd is the guy, or I guess gal, with the shepherd's staff taking care of the sheep. But also shepherd is a metaphor for king or ruler or leader. Someone who is a king or ruler of Israel is referred to as a shepherd. Somebody who takes care of the people. A good shepherd hears the voice of the people. Hears them crying out, and unfortunately, in Ezekiel and other places in the Old Testament, the prophets are very critical of the leaders of Israel for, guess what, not listening to the people, not listening to the needs of the people. A shepherd always hears the cries of the sheep, always. A bad shepherd doesn't care about the sheep. 
Jesus is a good shepherd. He cares about the sheep. He loves the sheep, and it shows the sheep what love is all about by laying down his life for the sheep. It's, it's very interesting, the connection, if you read the intersections this week, the connection between John chapter 10, which was just read, and 1 John 3.16. Now, uh, I know we all have, uh, a lot of us have John 3.16 memorized, right? For God so loved the world. That's a memory verse we learn as children. But I think 1 John 3.16 should be a really good memory verse because 1 John 3.16 is the definition of love. So let's put this on the screen. This is 1 John 3.16. This is how we know what love is. So John, the same one who wrote John chapter 10, is also writing the letter. 1 John says, Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for brothers and sisters. So what is love? Jesus on the cross laying down his life for us. And so the definition of love is the picture. Just imagine your mind, Jesus on the cross. That's what love is. And so we are called to love with the same love that Jesus loves us. So what is love? It's cruciform. It's shaped like the cross. Love has a shape to it. It's laying down our lives. And so the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. We are called to lay down our life for one another. So the good shepherd does what? He shows us what love is all about. If we want to know what love is, we look to the good shepherd that lays his life down for one another. Are you with me so far? Nod your head if you're with me. So we want to know what love is. It's agape, love, that's the Greek word for that, is lay down sacrificial, costly love. And so he shows us what love is. But the good shepherd also tells us and teaches us how to love. And this is where that voice and listening come in, is that we, if we want to know how to love our city, if we want to know how to love our neighbors, if we want to know how to love our spouses and our kids and our grandkids, we need to be able to listen to the voice of the shepherd who's teaching us how to love. All right, let's talk about sheep for a second. What's the first thing you think of when you hear the word sheep? Ah, right? Ah, bah, 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 bah. What else? How many people here have been told that sheep are dumb? Yeah, I mean, that video kind of speaks to it, right? Let, let's, t- let's talk to David and Paige here. Are sheep dumb? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, so we, are, we are sheep, right? That's the metaphor. Now, I know that's been hijacked in politics to say if you're a follower, you're a sheep. The Bible says we are sheep. We are followers, right? We're followers not of our culture. We're not followers of politics. We're not followers of politicians. And we're not followers of anybody out there with a platform telling us what to believe. We are followers of the Good Shepherd, right? I think that deserves an amen. That was weak, church. Amen? Yeah. But the sheep are dumb in the sense that they need a leader. But I found out that sheep really aren't all that dumb compared to other animals. So check this out, right? Check out what we learn about sheep. The sheep are actually surprisingly intelligent with an impressive memory and recognition skills. They build friendships, they stick up for one another, and they feel sad when their friends are led to slaughter. Okay, so here, here's some things. Sheep can remember the face of 50 individual people or animals for up to two years. 50, I can't even remember two people. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, sheep are extremely communal animals. They establish firm friendships and look out for each other in times of need. Sheep are capable of experiencing a whole range of feelings from fear to anger to despair to boredom and happiness. They're social creatures, so they dislike seclusion. They're docile. They like routine, and they, so they need patience. Uh, they don't like loud noises or yelling. They move best when not afraid, so they need someone to be slow and calm with them, like David and Paige, right? Perfect shepherds. And there, uh, there are wonderful things about sheep that I did not know. And two things I think are really important. Sheep must be led. And the other thing which makes them, uh, give them the reputation of dumb is that sheep tend to move in the opposite direction of their handler. And so those two things, they need to be led and they tend to move the opposite direction. 
You remember that song that says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it? That's this idea that the, sh- the sheep tend to wander off, and they need a good shepherd to take care of us. And so the good shepherd loves the sheep. The good shepherd is there to take care of the sheep, and the good shepherd is constantly speaking to the sheep. Now, today we have the opportunity to do a prayer walk, and, and uh, how many people here have done a prayer walk before? Raise your hand. A few, a few. Prayer walk's super easy, right? You just walk, and you can pray out loud or in your mind. I'm an introvert, so I tend to pray up here, right? Uh, sometimes I pray the Lord's Prayer as I'm walking. Right? I see people outside. I just say, Lord, be with this person, right? The goal as you prayer walk is to fall in love with the people that you see and to be able to hear their cries. And the only way we know that there's a need is to build a relationship with people that we're walking. So I was talking to Linda Goose, who is the leader of our uh, missions team, and we were talking about the prayer walk. And, I, you know, we, we talked about, well, how do we want to do the prayer walk? Because we could all meet downtown and walk together. Or the opposite is, is to trust that God's going to speak to us and tell us where to walk individually. Now, I love the idea of all of us gathering and walking together. But what I love even more is the thought that each one of us listen to the voice of the shepherd and obediently follow where he tells us to walk. And so I chose, after talking to Linda, that we would be people that would listen and we obediently follow where the shepherd leads us today as we walk or tomorrow. Or maybe it's a practice. It's a, it's a good practice. You get a little exercise, right? But it's also an opportunity to meet neighbors. And in our culture today, in this idea of uh, uh, individualism, we tend to isolate ourselves, and a lot of people don't know the names of neighbors. This is a great opportunity to just walk and pray for our neighbors, get to know them. So let's talk about listening for a second. The shepherd is always speaking, but in order to hear him, we have to listen. We have to actively listen. And in order to actively listen, we have to be honest that there are a lot of other voices screaming much louder than the good shepherd. We all know those voices, don't we? If you have your TV on, there are voices speaking at you, right? Whatever channel you have on, there are voices coming at you. Some of those voices could be good voices. If you're at home with family or friends or you're gathering, you will hear other voices. Some of those good voices are good. But let's be honest together today that the most important voice we need to hear is the shepherd. And so to a certain degree, in order to hear his voice, we need to turn off the other voices. One of the biggest things that I would ever suggest to you as your shepherd who loves you dearly is to turn off the news so you're able to hear the voice of the shepherd. I believe it's almost impossible to hear the voice of the shepherd when we have 24-7 news on. Because those voices, might not you might not think they're making an impact in your life, but if you listen to it over and over again, You will hear their voice, and that voice will change you. Listen to the voice of the shepherd. Turn off the news. Turn off Netflix. Turn off whatever voices that are screaming for your attention. And listen to the voice of the most important person who needs to speak to you today and every day. And that is the voice of Jesus. And he's constantly speaking so many times in my life. I'm like, I wonder if God is going to speak to me today. I believe he is speaking to all of us all the time. The question is, will we listen? And the key to that is to turn off the other voices so we're able to hear the voice of the one who loves us. Now, I can be honest and I say I've never heard the audible voice of God in my life. Now, I'm not saying that that doesn't happen because there's people in history who have heard the audible voice of God. But that does not mean that I don't hear God speak to me. He speaks to me through his word. He speaks to me through other people. And also, he speaks to me through the promptings of my heart. You know what I'm talking about? When he lays an impression on you to do something. I believe spiritual awakening, spiritual awakening does not happen in someone's life or a church unless we're listening to the voice of God. It begins with listening. So often we think that we must cry out to God to get his attention. God is already speaking. 
first thing we need to do is listen. And so today, we're going to be reminded of that. We bloom where we're planted when we obediently listen to the voice of the Good Shepherd. We're going to be reminded that God speaks to us. And so for us to be able to love our city and pray for our city, we want to begin with a few minutes of silence. So what we're going to do is I have my clock, <laughs> my phone, and we're going to just take a few minutes of quiet. Right? Try to block out the voices that are in your mind right? and see if you can hear that. And I, I have a few questions that we can put up on the screen. Um, if we could, there they are. Here's three questions to be listening for the answers to. You can ask these questions and just listen. Where do you want me to walk today? Downtown? A certain neighborhood, your neighborhood? Where do you want me to walk? So ask that question, just listen. Uh, who do you want me to love? Maybe there's a particular person or a particular need that he's going to lead you to a voice that's crying out out there that you can't hear, but he is allowing you to listen to today. Or who do I need to reconcile with? I mentioned forgiveness and all of that over the last few weeks in little blurbs, but I think it's important that we need to hear the voice of God to tell us, oh, we have a fractured relationship with someone that needs to be reconciled. And the reason I say that's important is oftentimes we try to ignore that prompting. Maybe in the quiet today, God will speak to you about someone you need to reconcile with. Those are just some promptings. I don't know what God's going to say to you, but for the next few minutes, let us be quiet before the Lord and see if we can hear his prompting today. Oh, silence is hard. That felt like an hour, and it was like, 
two and a half minutes. We're going to pray for our city. There's a voice or there's a verse that I'd like us to hear today. It's uh, Jeremiah 29, 7. It says, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Maybe you've heard it said, seek the welfare of the city. That's why we pray. That's why we serve. That's why we're listening. There's a, a list of organizations and people that we're going to pray for. So I'm going to pray, and then it, this word amen that we often use means yes. It means so be it. It means I agree with you. So as I'm praying, if you're in agreement with me in the prayer, just whisper or say out loud amen as a way of joining with me in this prayer for our city. So let's begin. Day. Lord, we come before you as people who seek the welfare of Columbus, Indiana, or the places in which we live. There are those around the world that are worshiping with us online, or maybe live in a neighboring town today. We pray for those cities as well. Today we start by praying for our local churches, the churches that dot our landscape, the churches with steeples and those without. We pray for them today as those that are worshiping right now as we speak and for those that will worship later or different times or different days, we lift them up to you. We lift their pastors to you, their leadership to you. Help every church love our city. It feels overwhelming individually, but collectively together, Lord, we believe that we can make a difference. So we pray for the local churches. We pray today for revival. And that word, Lord, I know gets misused so often to think of an evangelistic service or a service with a speaker or services, but we truly pray for the revival of our hearts, those believers that make up our city. We pray, Lord, that you will revive our hearts, revive our minds, revive our spirits, revive our bodies, and help us truly to be in love with you and to love those around us. We pray, Lord, that you would awaken in us a spirit of repentance. Repentance comes to us and to the people of our city through your kindness. Paul says in Romans that your kindness leads to repentance. And revival never will take place unless there's repentance. And it starts with the people in this room. And it starts with this person who is praying out loud. Help me, Lord, to live a spirit of repentance as modeling to those around us what it means to follow Jesus with our everything. We pray, Lord, for our local government. We pray for those, uh, the mayors and those on councils and committees that are serving those communities here in Columbus and around the world. We pray for them that you would give them wisdom and a spirit of love to help them understand how to take care of one another for the common good. We pray for uh, those that are doctors and we pray for those in um, uh, nurses and we pray for those in the medical field. We pray, Lord, for those in hospitals, and we pray for ambulance workers and 9-11 and, uh, operators, and we pray for social workers. We pray for all of those that are helping people. We pray for our, our police department and our sheriff's department. We pray for our firemen and all of the first responders. We pray for the judges and the court system and the jails, the prisons and detention centers. Lord, we pray for those that are in uh, nursing homes, and we pray for those that are taking care of those in nursing homes. We pray, Father, for the sick, the mentally ill, the elderly, and the dying. We also pray for the businesses that uh, are a part of our community, Lord, that they would be proper examples of faithful stewardship. We pray for our local schools and the teachers and the students, the administrators, the principals and the superintendents, the school boards. We pray, Lord, that you would be with our schools and help everyone involved to provide safety and education for the betterment of all children in our community. We pray, Father, for racial reconciliation. We pray, Lord, that reconciliation, bringing people together and building bridges is a part of who we are. We pray for our community that we would be able to join together as one. We pray, Lord, that we would be examples as a church of what it means to reconcile with those who are different than us. We pray for our families, those that are here today, those that are not here today. We pray, Father, for parents 
and grandparents who are trying to raise children and the difficulties of all that that means. I say often that parenting is the hardest job I've ever experienced. Lord, we pray for parents and grandparents today. We pray for kids, Lord, that you would help them grow up in knowledge of you. And we pray for every person in this community. We pray that you would bring healing into their lives. And now we pray for our city to collectively. We have a prayer that we're going to put on the screen. If you would join me in praying this prayer out loud. We pray for our city. There are so many needs all around us. We lift up to you those who are broken, those who are lost, those who are forgotten. Touch each one of them. May they find peace in you. Give us your eyes, Lord, that we might see the city as you do. This city is yours, God. We ask that these streets would know your joy and these people would feel your love. Help us to be great listeners. Help us to hear people's stories. You have called us to the nations. You have called us to love our brothers and sisters. Empower us also by the power of your Holy Spirit to love our neighbors. Show us how to be salt and light to the city. May our worship not be confined to these sanctuary walls, but let it overflow to the streets and onto the sidewalks. May we be your hands, your feet in this city. Your kingdom come, your will be done in Columbus as it is. Amen.